Hey guys, this is Joseph again, one of your TAs for Intro to Deep Learning. Today I'll be going over basics of AWS, SageMaker, IPython, and Jupyter Notebook. The goal of this recitation is to show you how to create a managed instance with Jupyter Notebook pre-configured and how to use the notebook. This option is ideal for people who are less comfortable setting routes, working with networks, and creating protocols. It's also good if you like Jupyter Notebooks, but you don't like using the terminal. Next recitation, we'll be talking about how to set up an EC2 instance. So for people who prefer to have more control over their environment, that'll be another option. I'm going to be talking about quite a few things this recitation, which includes AWS instance types and pricing, SageMaker Notebook instances, basics of IPython, modes in Jupyter Notebooks, general Jupyter shortcuts, Jupyter edit mode, Jupyter command mode, and I'll end by showing you how to start and submit homework zero if you haven't already. All right, let's jump into it. In recitation one, you'll learn how to create an EC2 instance and request access to GPUs. In this recitation, we'll be learning how to use SageMaker to create a notebook instance. In comparison, EC2 instances are generally cheaper and more versatile, while notebook instances are more expensive but easier to use if you like Jupyter. Though both the EC2 and SageMaker have a free tier resource, it's important to note that the resources we will be using cost money. Here, I've compiled for you the cost associated with three different types of instances. The T3, which does not have a GPU. The P2, which uses a NVIDIA Tesla K80 GPU. And the P3, which uses a NVIDIA Tesla V100 GPU. You'll notice both EC2 and SageMaker instances have access to these options. Because SageMaker instances are managed, which means they are a lot easier to start working with and require very minimal configurations, they are 40% more expensive. So this might not be the right option for you unless you think having a managed instance would save you a significant amount of time or if you think the benefits of being able to focus only on programming and training outweigh the cost of setup. Even between GPUs, we see that the V100 is three times more expensive than the K80. So you'll get three times more hours of training on the K80 than the V100. For most intensive purposes, the K80 is gonna be enough to finish training. But if you're consistently maxing out your GPU usage, then it might be worth considering switching to a V100 for efficiency. So let's talk about that. In this example, we have a really large job where we are training a large network on a really large data set for a significant number of epochs. Here, to get the same results, we see that the V100 is six times faster than the K80. But remember, the V100 is also three times more expensive than the K80. So, had you used the V100 to train this network, not only would you have finished the job faster, but you would have also spent half as much money to finish training. Students that are mindful of how they're spending their money and are comfortable switching between instances depending on their needs will get the most out of their credits. And that's it for the details on which GPU to choose. But what about when to use a GPU in the first place? Here are some examples of when you should use a GPU. We'll start with if you're finished or almost finished debugging. You don't want to spend time debugging while you're on a GPU instance, since there'll be time not spent using a GPU, unless you have some last GPU specific debugging to do. Once you're finished debugging or done doing those last minute checks, then it might make sense to use the GPU. Another condition is that you have double checked and made sure you have the correct model. You don't want to start using a GPU in training only to find out you trained on the wrong thing. So if your model is correct, 
then it might make sense to use a GPU. Finally, if you think you're ready to train, you might be tempted to use a CPU, but using a GPU will be much faster. You don't want to start a job on a CPU that could take days when you could have it run on your GPU and have it take hours. Okay, so what about when not to use the GPU? There's just a few more sanity checks, partially reiterating what we just talked about. The first is if you're writing data manipulation methods and doing basic pre-processing. Sometimes the data we give you will be very large and you'll want to process it first. This doesn't require a GPU, but one mistake students make is switching to a GPU instance because it has more memory so that they can work with data that would not fit into something like a T2 or T3. There's a variety of non-GPU instances to choose from. So if you have a workload that requires a lot of memory, but not a GPU, then you should look into other options. I've linked to a tool to compare these instance prices, and you should use what makes sense for your specific task. The second is if you've not finished debugging, or your model is not done. This is what we talked about before, where you only want to use the GPU for training and not for stuff that does not require the GPU. The third is for if any other reason you're not ready to train or you don't need to train faster. For example, if you're using one of the recitation notebooks that has a smaller data set and you just want to learn how the model trains with that, then those jobs should be doable on a CPU, and you can spend your time understanding the training process and looking at the results without worrying about spending a lot of money on stuff not related to training for your homework. One more thing worth mentioning is EC2 spot pricing. Even though SageMaker isn't through EC2, it's worth mentioning just so you're aware of it. In addition to EC2 being cheaper than SageMaker, you have the option to create a spot instance. These are instances that AWS has sitting around and people aren't using, so you can get them at cheaper prices. The main disadvantage to spot pricing is that your job might be terminated if someone else wants the instance you're using. People who pay for on-demand services get priority over those who pay for spotting services. The advantage is that spot price instances can be up to 90% cheaper than on-demand instances. So this is a nice way to save money if you're not in a rush and don't mind interruptions. I'll link more details here. SageMaker is still the easiest and fastest option to get started, but EC2 has significant savings. You could get even more savings if you take the time and patience to wait. With that said, Let's move on to SageMaker instance types and how to set them up. Amazon SageMaker is a special pre-configured instance that allows you to specifically run a terminal and Jupyter Notebook for machine learning. These are more expensive than EC2 instances, which you'll learn more about in Recitation 1, but these are easier to use. I'll put my browser side by side here so we can walk through how to set up SageMaker together. First, we go to console, AWS, amazon.com, forward slash SageMaker. Then, we choose notebook instances. Click Create Notebook Instance. On the Create Notebook Instance page, we type a name for our notebook instance. For the instance type, I'm going to choose a T3 medium because it's similar in cost but a newer version of the T3. You can change this later. For the I am role, we'll choose to create a new role. When we create role, we'll choose the none option. Finally, we'll choose create notebook instance. Hang tight 
as it'll take a few minutes to get set up with Anaconda in various deep learning libraries. Then we're ready to go. The time we have on the notebook instance and the free tier is 250 hours on the T3. There's other free options to look into if you have different needs. Now that we have the Jupyter Notebook set up, we can get familiar with what it has to offer. That starts with understanding the basics of IPython, since it's the Python interpreter that we'll use for the interactive computing, and that's native to Jupyter. Let's see some basic commands to get started. First, the question mark gives an introduction and an overview of IPython's features. In Jupyter, this will open a window at the bottom with the intro. You can choose to close it when you're done. Next, there's QuickRef, which is a quick reference for all IPython-specific syntax and magics. These are things that help you interpret different objects and code faster. You can close that when you're done. Now, we'll look into how to get details about an object. We do this by following an object with a question mark, and here's an example object. This object is a neural network that we might be interested in using and want to learn more about. Once it loads, we can look at its signature to see where it is, what arguments it takes, and other details. Now close that. If we want more details about the object, we can use two question marks. Now, you can see that it gives a bit more information than we got before, which is a nice thing to have. Then you can close that. Similarly, there's Python's built-in help system. We simply wrap the function or object we want help with and see what we might need to know when using it. If you want to use shell commands, you can also do that in the notebook. Here's an example where I use a Linux utility to check my swap usage. If you want to execute more lines, then we use the magic function mod mod bash. This makes the entire cell executable as bash. In this example, I create a log file in a directory and add to it a date and result. Since I'm done with the example, I'll remove that example directory. Okay, now on to some Jupyter specific utilities. More specifically, we'll be talking about modes in Jupyter Notebooks. Jupyter Notebook has two modes, edit mode, which can be accessed by pressing enter, or command mode, which can be accessed by pressing escape. You can tell which mode you're in by looking at your cell border or by looking at the Python icon in the top right. If you look at the cell border, green means you're in edit mode, while blue means you're in command mode. If you look under the Python icon on the top right, the pencil icon indicates you're in edit mode. If there's no pencil icon, then you're in command mode. You can also switch to edit mode by clicking inside a cell, or switching to command mode by clicking outside of the cell. Now that is clear, we can move on to general Jupyter shortcuts. These shortcuts work in both edit mode and command mode. First is shift enter, which allows you to run a selected cell. After it does that, the cell below will be selected. This is nice because you can hold shift and keep pressing enter to sequentially run cells. If you don't want to select the next cell, then you can just use control enter to only run the cell you're currently in. There's also another option where you do option enter, which lets you run a current cell and then insert one below. Finally, there's command S, which saves the notebook. There's more here specific to edit mode and command mode, and you can try them out if you're interested. 
The only one I'll show here is in command mode, which is H. If you're not using the same type of system as me, then what you give for H might be different, but all the shortcuts there for your reference. I'll wrap up this notebook by showing you how to start and submit Homework Zero. Homework Zero is basic math and data processing tasks that you'll use in the course. This primer is only worth 1% of your grade, but we encourage you to do it and try to get as much of it correct as you can because you'll be better prepared for future homeworks. First, we will go to Autolab. Then, we will select Homework 0. Under where it says Handouts, we will download the Homework 0 handout. Keep that tab open. Next, we will go to SageMaker. Before we start, I'm going to change my instance type by selecting it. And under Actions, choose Update Settings. I want a T2 Medium Notebook Instance Type. Then, I click Update Notebook Instance. Now I'm ready to go, so I click Start. You can see it is initializing because it says Pending. This might take a few minutes to load. Now that it's ready, I'll click on Open Jupyter. By default, I'm placed in the SageMaker directory. Once inside the notebook, I can upload the handout to the SageMaker directory by clicking Upload. Selecting the file and opening the file. We see it now in our SageMaker directory, but the extension is a little weird. So let's rename the file so it can be simply handout.tar.gz. Now, to untar the file, we need to use the terminal. To do this, go to New, then click Terminal, This will open a terminal with us in the home EC2 user directory. We can see this by looking at the present working directory with PWD. We can list segments with ls to see the directories in home EC2 user. And we see the SageMaker directory that our tar file is located. We can change directory with cd to the SageMaker directory. Now, if we list segments, we can see the tar file we uploaded. To untar, I'll execute the command tar with the tags x, v, z, f, where the x tag lets us extract files, the v tag lets us get a verbose output, the z tag is for gzip files, and the f tag says that we're giving a file name. We then specify the file name handout.tar.gz. Now I'll go back to the Jupyter console, and we see that we have the files ready to go. We simply click on the file to open the notebook. I'll do the first problem just to show how editing and submitting works. Problem 2.1 asks for the vectorized version of the dot product. In NumPy, this is simply np dot. So I'll assign np dot of the inputs to a result, then return that result, and we can also see the printed solution is the same as what we expect. Now, let's say we're done for now. So we save the notebook. Then we close the notebook and go into Jupyter console. In the Jupyter console, 
we select the notebook. We shut down the notebook. We select it again. Then we download the notebook. Now that we're done with that instance, I'll go into the SageMaker console, select the instance, then in Actions, we stop the instance. Now, going back to AutoLab, we click here to add the downloaded file. Affirm the statement here if you followed our academic integrity policy, then submit the notebook. That will take us here, or we'll wait a bit for our assignment to be graded. Reloading, we see that the problem we did was graded and passed successfully. If you want to see more details on the grading, we simply click the problem. And that's it for this recitation. Please let us know if you have any questions in the comments or by posting on Piazza.